today on the Learn It, Use It podcast, the Six Sigma shift, transforming operations and boosting customer satisfaction. Kind of comparing and contrasting between OM and EM, operations management, engineering management, and Lean and and Lean Six Sigma, uh, and kind of the differences, the things that are the same, or the things that you see, or how do they apply to be done effectively in each of those? It it sort of tackles it a little bit more. I see the engineering side um, kind of as the uh, the offense, um, and then OM coming in afterwards as uh, once the product or service is in operation and once it's designed and coming in as the defense to shore things up. This podcast is by the Operations Management and Engineering Management Programs in the College of Engineering at the University of Arkansas. In our programs, we stand by Learn It Today, Use It Tomorrow. The instructors for our courses are professionals with real-world experience where you will be able to immediately apply what you have learned. Today's workforce is changing rapidly and all fields require adapting to new environments, which means you need new credentials quickly to improve your current performance. Our graduate programs and certificates apply to all industries so you can be competitive in today's workforce. Today's host is Dr. Richard Hamm, who is the Associate Director of the Master of Science in Operations Management and Master of Science in Engineering Management at the University of Arkansas. Rich retired from the United States Air Force and the Department of Homeland Security, where he held various national and regional leadership roles. He is a recognized subject matter in Homeland Security, consulting domestically and internationally for the United States government. Rich also teaches courses in leadership, cybersecurity, global competition, homeland security, resilient design, and unmanned aircraft systems. Justin Pate is a Six Sigma Master Black Belt and founder of Paramount Strategy Firm. In this role, he trains Fortune 500 managers to excel in operational excellence, strategy, analytics, and continuous improvement. As an operations management professor, he has won eight distinguished teaching awards, published two books, and 12 papers in peer-reviewed journals, conducted 30 expert media interviews, and has been cited in other research publications over 500 times. Before becoming an academic practitioner, Justin spent 12 years in various management roles for InformEd, including Chief Operations Officer, overseeing all aspects of the company's operations to deliver medical education programs to over 800,000 positions and healthcare workers nationwide and large entities such as the Mayo Clinic and the Cleveland Clinic. Justin holds a PhD and a Master of Science in Operations Management and is a certified Six Sigma Master Black Belt. Welcome, gentlemen. All right. Well, thank you, Karin, for that uh, introduction, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. This is a a very interesting, and especially in the last few years, this topic about um, Lean Six Sigma and how it has uh, dramatically changed. Uh, And by dramatically changed, I don't mean that the techniques changed so much, but the application of the techniques in areas that traditionally we hadn't really thought of before uh, is is it seems exploding. The interest in uh, Lean and Six Sigma techniques continue to grow in areas that we, you know, just really didn't uh, think uh, had any kind of uh, application before. So uh, today we have with us Justin uh, Bate. He's an operations management professor and he's a, a Six Sigma master black belt and uh, does work with Paramount Strategy Firm and uh, is accomplished. And we are delighted to have him uh, with us today. So thank you for being with us, Justin. Yeah, thank you, Rich. Glad to be here. Looking forward to our talk. So uh, a couple of things in in our case in particular. So at the University of Arkansas, to kind of tell everybody some of uh, one of the things that we we consider a strength is the fact that we have both operations management and engineering management programs, and they're all housed in the uh, College of Engineering and Industrial Engineering. Um, it's a little unique. Operations manager management uh, sometimes is, um, you know, in business schools, but it's a strength for us in that we have this two things now, kind of the intersection of those. And we've had some others where we've spoken to people at startups, say in the aerospace, um, where they have an EM function and an OM function and how those things come together. And uh, always uh, we have we talk about two things. One is project management, and the other one is the application of Lean Six Sigma. 
So we're going to kind of explore those things with you today. So to start off with, um, first off, uh, Justin, can you give us a little bit about your background? Uh, you know, we got some in the intro, but just uh, uh, something a little bit more granular about your background in uh, Lean Six Sigma. Sure. Yeah, I'll be glad to. Um, so as you mentioned, I um, have a Six Sigma Black Master Black Belt certification. And so leading up to that requires um, a significant amount of work history um, and project documented project completion. And so uh, since about 2011, I have uh, been working on Lean Six Sigma projects. We didn't really add the word lean uh, to it at that time. Um, and I started off um, as a uh, yellow belt, green belt, black belt, and, and then earned the master black belt certification. The way I started off in Lean Six Sigma was just working on project teams, looking at, um, at, at InfraMed, where I was employed at the time. Uh, we were looking at, uh, we had a cross-functional team of people who are interested in efficiency and streamlining processes and reducing variation um, in our operation. And I volunteered and got involved and uh, was a project team member. Um, from there, I was able to uh, sit on a couple of other teams and then eventually lead my own team and uh, come up with uh, ideas, uh, really what we were tasked with doing um, in about 2014, my first project was to, um, to reduce the expenses and variations and wait time in a large call center. And in fact, if anybody is interested in that, there's a case study that's been published about that project um, that's used in different schools. Um, and what I have... Um, learned during that time was a as you mentioned the project management part is a big um, part of six sigma and um, b i i really liked improving processes and i really liked looking for errors and figuring out how to mistake proof things and then from that point forward i just as we went into 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, as company, and especially during the pandemic, as, as companies started looking at getting more lean and paying more attention to operations management, which was always sort of a second chair discussion, um, because you know we focus on revenue first and then organization later. But now that operations management is at the forefront, techniques used in OM and EM, such as Lean Six Sigma, are... Um, becoming more prevalent now. And so I've had an opportunity to work on dozens of projects um, over the last five years as a black belt. And then um, that allowed me to sit for the master black belt exam. Okay. So a lot of experience and a lot of things. And that's, you know, and we appreciate you giving your perspective on that. It's important. So I, I'll let's kind of start just broadly about uh, a description of what really is Six Sigma and how does it apply? Let's start first off with operations management. So we're talking about, everybody thinks traditionally, um, you know, operations management is a manufacturing company. We're making widgets and, you know, we're on a production floor, but the application in operations, I mean, my background was uh, operations and aviation and we had applications of those uh, everywhere that were really more uh, some safety some focused on uh, you know how do we have more streamlined operations to make decisions every day or to uh, you know reduce waste um, but in operations management which is pretty wide really where first off what is it and what do we get from it in OM sure so yeah, and operations management, as some of the listeners and watchers will will know, is about uh, managing continuous tasks. And it's as opposed to a project where we have a finite start and finish. In operations, we're looking at the day-to-day -day, um, continuous flow of activities in an organization and um, and how we manage those. And so where Six Sigma comes in at is in operations is being able to 
take out a segment or take out a section of those continuous activities, pull them out and evaluate them using tools like statistical process control and see, are they running the way we want them to run? Are, is what is supposed to be happening happening? Um, and it certainly does not just apply to, to manufacturing, as you mentioned, but uh, in the service economy, it's even most prevalent. Uh, as I mentioned earlier with the um, with the wait times, um, you know, we, we could have an expectation at a bank that customers will come in and not uh, wait any longer than five minutes. And that is going to be our promise to our customers. So now we've set the standard of what we expect to happen. And then we look at that over a week, over two weeks and say, how many times did that actually occur? And how many errors were there? And in Six Sigma, our goal is to move towards an idealized state of no more than 3.4 defects or mistakes per 1 million attempts. And so that sounds like very few, and it is. And again, it's something that we are aiming towards for continuous improvement. Um, and so that is, when, once we do that and we sort of run it as a project and we say we've identified this issue with the wait times, and now we are, um, we're going to address it and we're going to put a, a, a project team together, put together a Six Sigma charter, et cetera. And then what we do with operations is then once it's resolved, we transfer it back into the operation, back into the continuous flow. We don't want to keep it out as a project very long or any longer than we need to. Projects are all about opening and closing on time and on, on budget but then moving it back into there and then setting up controls um, and Six Sigma, Lean Six Sigma has a variety of control techniques we can use um, to ensure that the changes we've made are actually still in effect over the long term and are sustainable. So that's sort of the, the view from an OM perspective. Well, and that has... So, I mean, I can tell you from those I've been involved in, a lot of times you find yourself uh, having so many disciplines involved. I mean, sometimes you're, you know, doing time motion studies, you're looking at, uh, you know, trying to look at non-value added steps. I mean, you really uh, kind of step off into several different areas. And so with that in mind, what do you think are the biggest challenges and, uh, you know, that a organization has when they decide to implement that program. I mean, you know, you've got all these things. You know, we used to have a saying um, in the military, if everything's important, nothing's important. And so then you spend a lot of time figuring out what to focus on. So what are the challenges when you go to implement? Sure. Well, that's a that's a great question, Rich. And it's very easy for everybody to pinpoint problems. Um, and for a new chief operating officer or director of operations to come in and say, you know, this is a problem, that's a problem, that's a problem, that's a problem. Well, for each one of those problems is a set of processes that are taking place. And for each set of processes, we have a process owner. And that process owner um, is going to, um, A, either be your best friend or be your worst enemy. And your job is to figure out how to shift towards the friendly side. That process owner is the person who has, who's in control of the process. They're doing it day to day. They're not the director who's looking at it and saying, you know, uh, Justin, this needs to be fixed. This is actually Justin who's doing it. And it's part of, let's say I was in charge of the of payroll and I'm a payroll clerk and I'm the payroll director. Well, I'm the process owner for, for payroll. And, um, there's a lot of resistance to change that can occur there naturally, um, which shouldn't be surprising. The key is um, to overcoming that is really the level of authority that the project champion and the project sponsor has. Um, the biggest challenge that I have run into when we identifying the issues are, are the easy part. And Nobody really likes it when the Six Sigma guys come into the office, um, especially when they're from an outside consultant or when they are, you know, for example, um, I've done some work with McKesson and they have a 
Six Sigma office that um, specifically focuses on um, Six Sigma projects uh, year round internally. And each one of them, there's about six of them, uh, six or seven of them, and each one of them is responsible for identifying issues and saving $2 million a year. So when those folks come in, you know things are going to be changing um, and they're looking for it. And so most people, when they are able to see the benefits that this methodology can bring to their processes um, and to their daily work and to the end customer, um, we'll, we'll hop on board. Most reasonable people do that. Um, but you sometimes run into the challenge of, you know, I've been doing the same thing for 25 years and it's fine. And that's very difficult. And besides being a charismatic servant leader and working your way th with some diplomacy, having a strong project champion um, can help. For example, if I am uh, not in HR, but I'm a part of our of our process improvement team, and we've had multiple complaints from onboarding um, uh, from onboarded employees that the process just takes too long, it's too cumbersome, it's too manual, and it's slow, and it takes just a, a it takes a month for me to come on. And so some director, some executive has identified that and looking at survey results. And I said, well, we need to get that fixed. Justin, go go over to HR and, and work with them on it. Well, I'm going to have to deal with the, with the process owners who's doing that onboarding. Um, but my job is going to be a lot easier if I come in there and say, this is championed by the CEO, or this is championed by the vice president of operations or your director of, of human resources, chief human resources officer or whatever sent me here and they are overseeing, this is their idea. You're the implementer. You're not necessarily um, the process engineer and you're not necessarily the process designer. You're the improver. So when you're able to come in and folks know that the person that's sponsoring this project and championing it behind the scenes is of high level, high level authority, carries influence in the organization, um, that can make that transition of integrating into a process owner's daily life a little bit easier as to opposed to just say, I've just decided to come here myself and fix things. Well, yeah, and you just, you know, you kind of segued into you know, one of the reasons we have a micro certificate in leading operational changes because that fits here too, right? I had a great mentor when I was young. He talked to, you know, things that uh, just great leaders knew that if you want to affect change, you, you need to get that buy-in from the top and say it. And he used to say when you're making changes, he said, say it and then say it again and say it over. And when you think you said it too many times, say it one more time. And the idea being to drive that home. One of the things that I think many folks have struggled with is this um, idea of, well, is it right for me? And so, I, you know, if someone thought, you know, I need to figure out, is Lean, you know, Lean Six Sigma good for me? Where where would I, you know, start to see, hey, does this process, do I need to understand the intricacies of the it? Do I need to, I mean, what is it I need to know to put those together to say and to learn more, to understand you know, what, what's useful. Sure. And so you mentioned uh, DMAIC and if somebody is thinking, you know, is this the field for me? Is this something that I want to look at? Well, it is important to understand the, the core principle of define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. That is the um, DMAIC method and a methodology that we follow in Six Sigma to um, accomplish the goals of reducing this variation. If you're working in a large organization, um, let's, you know, a big Fortune 500 company, more than likely you'll have an area that has a team focusing on process improvement, um, business BPI, business process improvement. Um, sometimes it's the, a, a change management um, area. Uh, and really, if you are thinking about a career in operations and you're thinking a career in engineering and you're wondering, should I 
segue into um, Lean Six Sigma, the question that you have to ask yourself is how excited do you get from making ordinary things better? And that is what we call continuous improvement. In our field, we don't necessarily achieve astronomical results in a month. Okay. We achieve incremental improvements and we're we like to identify issues and achieve incremental improvements over time that then eventually have a bigger role on the company. So if you're looking for the big bang, it's not as exciting as say, um, you know, another field. However, if you're able to save five seconds, 30 seconds, okay, if you're able to save $100,000 per employee, if you're able to even make some small incremental reductions, then, and you get excited about that, then this could be a field for you. Um, now, understanding, uh, I know UARC has the Lean Six Sigma certificate and um, the DMAIC method is, is covered in there. And the question that you know, pops up is, well, where do I go to even get started? Um, the thing with Six Sigma is there is no uniform set single accrediting body out there that manages certifications. There are very reputable associations and organizations that will um, uh, put together quality standards for what a, a Six Sigma certain level belt should know and test them and evaluate them. And, and those are out there. So it's careful not to, you have to be careful not to just Google, you know, get a Six Sigma black belt because there's, you have to really gauge the quality of those. Um, and so if you're interested, really looking at a, you know, a program like this one where you come in and you're able to take courses and you're able to take, uh, I believe it's three or four courses in the certificate program, and take your time learning it without having to sit for a certification test right away, um, that could give you a good gauge on whether or not it's even worth you pursuing or not, just the first class, just the first class could. Um, the um, other question that I tend to field is, well, what about statistics? I'm not that great of a math person. I like to improve things, but I'm not a math person. And, and frankly, I mean, I have a background in applied statistics, and so it might be easier for me to say this, um, but it's basic algebra, the, the math that we do, um, and at, at its core sense. And so not at, at this point, we're not even really doing anything by hand. We're just we're utilizing Minitab, we're utilizing Sigma Excel, we're using um, stats. We're using all sorts of different um, programs to handle the stats for us. And there are software functions out there that are deliberately geared towards Six Sigma projects that will do a lot of this for you. So do you need to be a statistician um, to join this field? No. You need to have a basic understanding of math and algebra, of course, like for, for any other field. The key skill set that you want to not necessarily have, but develop if you don't have it, um, is again that 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 energy for incremental change and being able to not only work in the weeds on a project, managing a project team, but being able to have the skills to be able to turn around and speak up to the executive board as well about here's the status of this project, here's the funding that we need, here's where we're at on the budget, here's the expected earned value, and oh, there's a couple of board members who really think this project is a waste of time, and we don't believe in, in Six Sigma, and that's old news, and why are you even following that? Just go in there and fix things, okay? Be able to have those high-level conversations um, is probably more important than the technical skills that software will do for you nowadays. Yeah, soft skills are obviously a, a, a huge part of uh, implementation. And I, and I see it over and over, some folks that uh, 
really get the technical pieces, but the soft skills are left, and it's hard to be successful if you don't have those as well. I know what you mean. I, yeah, it really is. I, I've seen some folks do great projects, but then they just couldn't quite uh, deliver or communicate it, and it kind of uh, it, it it would kind of fall to the wayside because of that. Certainly to to try to get people motivated. One of the things that motivates change is for people to see that it actually is something worth doing. Um, and, uh, you know, that kind of brings us into, so you've talked about tool, all sorts of tools, SAS, even some things that you can do uh, in Excel, Minitab, Sigma Excel, all these different tools, but then also techniques uh, within uh, Lean Six Sigma. And so when you look at those, I mean, all of us have, you know, kind of the favorite, uh, the ones that I, the ones that have been most eye-opening to me and the ones where I either owned the process or where I was on teams looking was in Demaic, the D part, because people are amazed because they've never defined even what the process was. And when you spend time, they look at all, they immediately, even before you apply techniques, they see all this waste. You know, the same person having to review a project four, five, six times, you know, uh, people that have no no value added steps that are in there, right, uh, all right. sorts of things. So so with that in mind, you've got this broad uh, and deep experience. What are the favorite techniques or tools, those things that you found to be the most useful? Uh, and uh, I don't know if eye opening is the word, but the things you can get excited about because you like you enjoy that part. All right. No, that's a that's a great question. And and you know, you you rightly called it on the D part on define in the Demaic method. That's the part that we'll probably spend the most time on, or we should um, spend the most time on that. As you mentioned, um, sometimes there's an aura of we need to fix something, but we don't know exactly what the root cause is. And so my favorite um tool to use is value stream mapping. And I it, value stream mapping fits so neatly into that defined stage. I mean, when we get to the measure and analyze, I can, I'm very familiar with the, the uh, statistical techniques there. But at the beginning, when you're walking in, and this also helps with leading that change and, and working with the process owners to say, Let's document our current state. What is it that we are doing exactly right now? And the key part in the definition stage is to not jump ahead and say, well, okay, let's let's document what we want it to look like. No, we have to document it as it is right now, even if it's embarrassing. Even if we start to see things as we're going through, as you mentioned, like why are we, why are we doing that? Okay, why are we, you know, why does somebody have to put their finger on this three times before it is able to get approved? Um, and so value stream mapping allows us to come in and unlike a process map that is, um, could have hundreds of steps to it, a value stream map is very high level. You typically want to have a value stream map that um, is like seven to 10 blocks, okay? And covers just the high level steps of creating value for the customer. So from, from beginning to customer, we'll call it customer delivery, okay? And in, in a case such as this, since I was talking about, um, I was talking about uh, employee onboarding, or we could take a sales cycle. We could take, a, I don't want to focus on manufacturing because really it's, it, there's so many areas in the service sector that we can, um, we can use. But let's say that we have a, a sales cycle um, and we're the sales manager for a large um, organization and I'm managing sales reps. And it, it starts with uh, how do we create value? Now that is what we will look at for a value stream. Now companies will have multiple value streams, but in this particular case, the value stream could be customer initiates contact all the way to product is delivered. Okay, now what happens in between there is what has to happen over and over and over and over again, the continuous operation for us to create value to the customer, for us to generate revenue for the company, 
for us to exist. And so we know that there could be a hundred different steps, maybe even a thousand steps in between that stream that I just wrote, but we would set it to look something like um, customer inquires on, let's say on a website, customer inquires um, about an estimate. Sales rep contacts the customer to schedule an estimate. Okay, estimate takes place, proposal is prepared, proposal is reviewed and delivered, customer signs off, work starts, the end product in, in this case would be that the work is starting is delivered. And let's throw in a customer demo in there as well, okay? Because often the first thing that we could look at there is lead times and process times. So we've got those, let's say eight steps. And we say, we know that there's a lot of processes that happen and occur underneath these, but we just wanna look at this from a high level perspective and say, what is the process time? And what is the lead time for each one of these steps? Now, the process time is the time it takes once you get there, once you're on that step, how long it takes to complete. And the lead time is going to be how long it took to get there from the prior step. So just to throw out, you could probably see that if we have step A, customer inquires on the website, and step B, customers contacted by a sales rep, and we have a lead time of two weeks, you can probably see where that's not ideal, right? And we're able to do that now because we've visualized it and we've sat down and we've looked at this from a high level and said, well, why are we waiting two weeks? Oh, well, we're waiting two weeks because it takes, the, there's a backlog of requests and maybe we don't have enough intake specialists to, um, to make the, the outbound calls to see if they even qualify for our type of service anyway. Um, Perhaps there is just a lot of tag going on where we say, hey, let's schedule a call to take place. And we're emailing back and forth with times and it takes a while. Um, perhaps we just don't get it quick enough because, you know, we're we're out and we're busy and I'm the only person who is able to handle it. And I'm looking at them on my phone and I just have to take them in the order that I can. There's a lot of reasons why that could take two weeks. And it's important for us not to jump too ahead. Um, and try to solve it right then and there. But as you mentioned, you can start to see the issues. You start to see those develop. And as you go to the next step and the next step and the next step, and you say, okay, this is the current state, the current state value stream. This is exactly what we're doing right now. Now let's dissect it. Let's look at these process times, these lead times, percent complete and accurate. How many times, you know, how many errors are we getting? How many times does what we expect to happen happen? Um, you know, you can look at a lot of different metrics and key performance indicators there. Uh, but that is always an eye opener for folks when you're coming in to the boardroom, you're coming in with the with the um, with the process owners because a, it gets their buy-in because you may not, as a six Sigma expert, you may not know the process. You may not know the stream. Your job is to get it out of the people who are running it and document it for them and ask those questions. So they're actively participating in this and saying, no, this is what we do. This is what's next. This is what's next. You know, you don't have to be a subject matter expert in every field yourself. And so then you can say, okay, is this the current state? Everybody agrees. This is what you've all put together. This is the state. Now let's dissect it. And from there, I think that um, the appreciation for value stream mapping uh, comes in because everybody can look at a map and tell what's going on. Not everybody can look at a statistical output and tell what's happening. So, um, and it brings in buy-in from the people who are providing you with the inputs. It creates um, uh, discussion and dialogue about the, the current state. It also involves the process owner so they don't feel like they're left out. And and then we have a nice visual that we can work on from there. Yeah, that's, that's two in the I, I find, <laughs> No, it's not. And I, I find, you know, the ones I've been involved with, just like you said, it's it's that those initial stages are really um, 
they're eye-opening for people even within the organization because they don't realize how long it's taking them and what it's costing them. So, so you know, one of the things that we we hear in Lean Six Sigma is we have people with other types of quality uh, management or system, so other programs like Toyota Kata. You hear all these different types. Kind of, can you give us a a high level, uh, you know, kind of explain the differences about those? What's the difference between these other quality programs and Lean Six Sigma? Mm -hmm. And, sure. and uh, how they're produced. So, quality management is um, is an, an important aspect. Quality assurance, quality control, and a lot of times, what the the difference with Lean Six Sigma is that we are specifically focusing on defects and reducing variation. So, let's take just the word lean out of Six Sigma for a second and consider lean to be a separate method, okay? Um, when we talk about lean, we're talking about how can we get from A to Z in the shortest time possible? How can we, you know, remove steps? How can we make things faster? How can we accomplish what we want to accomplish as quickly as possible? And as you saw, probably, um, over the last couple of weeks, a lot of major tech companies are now saying this is going to be the year of lean. Um, and again, you see the, these topics coming to the forefront of business, whereas, you know, over a period of time, it's been, you know, what produces revenue, what produces revenue, what produces revenue. Well, eventually, as companies mature and the revenue ceiling is limited or declining, the only other way to make a profit in the profit equation of revenue minus expenses is to look at the expense side. And so we start to say, you know what, instead of putting out like Meta is doing um, and, and Facebook, instead of putting out all of these different new possible revenue producing ideas, we're going to focus on the other side of it right now and get lean and, and try to increase our profit margins that way. So with Six Sigma, we're specifically focused on getting towards less than 3.4 defects per million. And we focus on variation as opposed to speed. And that is a, a big difference between other quality systems. Now, when we are looking at, let's say, um, TPS and um, the Toyota systems, and we're looking at, let's say, at a, at a Coca-Cola bottling plant, we have... Um, uh, we, we have a quality assurance team. Quality in general is to ensure that the, that what the product or service is performing to the minimum level of expectations of the customer. Not necessarily the maximum level and the best, but the minimum level. So we have a minimum quality checklist of it needs to be able to when you when you turn on your TV, it needs to be able to turn on, okay? And that's um, what we call critical to quality factor, CTQs, okay? These things that have to happen in order for it, for the customer to be, um, to meet customer ex expectations. And so that's what generally quality is about. It's when the pizza is delivered to your house, it needs to arrive hot. Okay, it, it shouldn't arrive cold. So we have to put some systems in place to ensure that that quality metric is, is met. Um, and so one, lean is looking at speed. Overall quality management, again, lo looks at, are we meeting the customer expectations at the, at the very basic level? And then Six Sigma is looking at where are there errors in our day-to-day -day operations and where's their variation and how can we reduce that variation? Now, that reduction in variation may result in speed increases, may result in quality increases, may result in cost savings, may result in um, uh, more headcount, may result in a lot of things, but that's uh, secondary output. Yeah, a lot, a lot to unpack and what you were talking about in several of these areas. In fact, um, if we look at other areas, 
So as an example, Mike, one of the things that I found, <clears throat> so I was in the federal government and uh, a director of a large program and in DC, boy, they love dashboards. They live and die by dashboards. And if you can make it, um, you know, green, yellow, red dashboards with whatever metrics you put in, that's even better because, you know, they want to understand, you know, you know, I had, we had some processes. We were trying to understand a, a million operations, a million passengers a day and to look at that. And those metrics, trying to get them to let go of those metrics is really difficult. And some of that, I think you kind of spoke about, Hey, you get, you can, integrate those but part of it and I you know I don't want to chase a rabbit too much but part of the issues come with these highly compliant processes so places like you mentioned HR got a lot of Department of Labor rules you have to follow um, when I was in Homeland Security we had a lot of rules and programs you had to comply but when you're working the chains there have you worked any projects where you're trying to you know what you hear from everybody oh we can't do that because of and they would tell you there's a compliance process that they think affects it but maybe not so much just in their mind that it did how do you overcome that kind of a thing with these yeah. highly compliant processes yeah well i mean you and you point out something a general elephant in the room is that a lot of these uh practices that we practice in business may not always translate to the government so well and vice versa. Um, and that is, um, that doesn't mean that it can't be done, just means that you have to take a few extra steps. So when I was with the Continuing Medical Education um, Institute, one of the um, projects that I led um, was the three-year reaccreditation. Um, and so to, to provide courses and seminars and workshops all around the country for physicians to take for CME credits to renew their license every two years. Not anybody can just do it. You have to be a registered um, institution, registered school, accredited school by the ACCME. And the ACCME Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education, as you mentioned in, with the federal government, has uh, uh, a whole uh, library full of rules and compliance that have to be and compliance attributes that have to be met. And so you think, well, okay, perhaps one of the biggest expenses um, outside of hosting, especially when we move to uh, online courses, as we transitioned uh, that way, this was in, you know, 09, 10, 11, we were moving more into the digital course area. One of the largest expenses was postage for mailing out certificates of completion. And it doesn't sound a lot, but when you're serving 800,000 people a year, that can lead up to quite a bit. And then you have the wrong address and somebody doesn't get it and they need a duplicate copy. And you know those have to be printed nicely. They have to be mailed and you have to pay for postage. And we would have loved at the time to move to some type of electronic certificate. But at the time, the rule was that you have to provide a hard copy. Why? I don't know. Um, I'm out of that business now. And so I don't know what's happening there now. But at that time, ACCME accredited providers had to provide a hard copy certificate. And, you know, sometimes you know, depending on the profession, they make rules to protect themselves and, and so forth anyway. Um, and maybe that was, uh, they weren't up to speed in the digital age at that time. It's been a while. Um, but that was an expense we had to, we had to endure. So we had to say, okay, well, even though we know that this is the, the fix, okay, and that this is a great fix, we can't do it because of compliance requirements. And in that case, we um, also had issues with the, not issues, but we had very qualified um, faculty who were not MDs that were um, considered to be medical experts um, from out of the country. And they were here and they could present these um, 
these seminars very well. Um, but we were not able to do that because a certain percentage of the staff had to have MDs from the United from the United States. And so those are just things that you have to eat if you're going to play in the game. Um, the only other way to do it is to become a part of that and change the rule, but that I wouldn't recommend. I wouldn't recommend that. So a lot of times you have to say, you know, these are not, these are just a cost of doing business. And these are not errors that we can fix. Of course, we can, we can skim the surface around it and try to cut as much fat as we can off of it, you know, depend the paper that we want to use on the certificate and those types of things. But then you also have to manage, you know, quality and customer service. And if you want somebody sitting at home putting a flimsy certificate on their desk that has your company name on it. So you have to also think about reputation and those types of things. And that's the mistake that a lot of folks think about when they think about Six Sigma, that it's only about cost cutting. It's about improvement. And improvement could lead to um, lower costs. It could lead to higher costs, but a more satisfied customer. Um, when we were moving buildings, I'll never forget this because when we were moving buildings in 2012 and we went with a landlord um, who was pretty, pretty strict landlord. He was hard to negotiate with, but we also... Had a, we were post recession, so we had a little bit of wiggle room um, with them, and the price per square feet got got pretty low. But we said, look, we're gonna we'll handle tenant improvements. When we come in, we you know we're gonna want this door here, this there. We're gonna put an office here. We're gonna do those things. We'll eat up. We'll eat the tenant improvement costs. And so you know we started to put not cheap, but not the most expensive doors across the um, across the office, a and construction got stopped. We got stopped on 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 site when their construction manager came to review. Um, and so we said, "What what's going? We're in charge." we and he said, "These are tenant improvements. It has to improve the experience of the of the place, not just for you now, but for the future tenants, the future customers, not just." tenant cost reductions, which is what we were looking for. We were trying to get through and, and get in there cheap and do it ourselves. So that that answers. Yeah, it it does. And it, and it it's uh, <clears throat> and the medical field. Um, it's like, you know, a, a project that I work. So one of the things that I that I had and we actually did a, a, a lean, a big, a large lean process was uh, screening at airports across the country, security screening, and uh, you, you've got wait times that have a standard, 20-minute standard, and you've got defects of how many times my agents could sneak a bomb, gun, whatever it was, through, and then you're measuring those things. And um, it, it's amazing because we could, you know, those two things both are very important. Uh, equally important. Uh, in fact, there's there's risk associated with long wait times because you have soft targets that are in an area that's not protected, and so active shooters and other things. So the risk goes up if you have a lot of people in the uh, lobby before that. But we would always look. I would send teams at places that had really low wait times. So you went to a large airport, and they were showing eight minute wait times where the other comparable ones were showing 18 minute wait times we would go there to see if we could defeat the systems and if we couldn't if the if the rate if the fail rate was running the same then we would send teams in and say okay let's look at what they're doing and try to replicate that to places to bring everybody along and we followed the lean process we did which kind of brings me to a long diatribe to ask the question. So we have operation. Everybody can see manufacturing. They see it right off the bat. It's pretty easy to see, hey, I'm, I want to make widgets faster. But in the service area, the service sector, um, what's the difference between those two? I mean, we know that people are applying them, but what's what do you see as the primary difference between the service sector piece, services provided and manufacturing? Yeah, that's a, a good question. And I like that about the, um, the screening. I like that screening example. 
you know, in the, the service sector is much harder to manage for a lot of reasons. Um, and it's much harder to seek continuous improvement because not everything is as visible to you. Um, we have, you know, intangible products. So um, we don't have something that we can we can look at and say, this is a defect. Um, quality is sometimes in the eye of the beholder. We can look at, let's say, my cup here and say, okay, the straw, when I put some suction on the straw, nothing is coming out. Well, I think everybody can agree that that's a defect, right? Um, but if I were to, in the, in the service sector, there really is not always a standard expectation amongst all customers that you can work to standardize, which makes it a lot easier than to reduce errors and uh, at a massive level. So we have intangible, you know, not not tangible products. We have the inability to to store inventory. We have um, demand variations that are much harder to predict. And I I'll I'll bring it down to, you know, uh, let's say Starbucks because a lot of people would think Starbucks is, uh, you know, they sell a product but they also offer a service. Okay. And, and, and that's true. When I come into the Starbucks and I request a mocha frappuccino, well, the expectation that I have as a product is going to be that it tasted like the one that I had at the airport and it tasted that the one that was at Starbucks and, and so forth and that I'm going to, I'm going to get it. From the service side, though, what makes it a little bit more difficult is what we call the customer decoupling point. I have the expectation that when I come in there and place that order, that they're not going to say, okay, come back tomorrow while we go and get the beans and the materials and, and make it for you. Now, if I go to a Maserati dealership and want a lot of customizations onto a car, I realize that that you know that expectation's not there. So again, it's it's it it varies, but I'm expecting that that organization is going to have everything that it needs to provide those to provide those products um, right then and there. I am not expecting that the decoupling point where the where the inventory is at or where the actual value is at in relation to the customer in the supply chain, I'm not expecting that to be too far away. I'm expecting it to be at the delivery stage, right? And so we have, um, it's a harder, harder way to do statistical process control. Um, unless we have years of data that we can standardize, then it's hard to run things through charts and through graphs and look at trends and be able to, to make predictions that way. So it's a little bit tougher in the service sector there. We also um, have sometimes what we call an invisible product. Uh, and an invisible product, again, can't be I'll just give a very simple example. When I go in and give a haircut, get a haircut for my barber, and I say, I want it this way and this way, it could be a very standard request, but every barber could perform it differently. And every customer could have an expectation of what it's going to look like. And so that is a service. And I also have to be trained and ready for whatever demand comes in. If I say I'm a men's or women's barber shop, I can't have somebody come in and just say, I want the most basic men's cut and I don't know how to do it. So you have to be prepared there. And there's no inventory there to store, right? It's all, you know, talent and skill. So um, those are the major challenges there. Um, and when that comes to Six Sigma, that really, it, it's harder to pinpoint what is the error, what is the root cause and what is it that we're looking to fix? Are we looking to fix that the customer was not happy with their haircut, even though the last 10 people were, but now this person is not? Is that an issue? Or do we have an issue with our equipment, which is something a lot easier to, to define and to, um, to address? 
Yeah, that one's really tough because the whole thing is judged by, you know, customer satisfaction, right? So when we look at that, like in our service sector course, we specifically have those conversations about the use of, but, but the difficult part is that uh, people that aren't happy, a lot of times they don't, they don't give you, they don't give you feedback. They just vote with their feet. You never see them again. And uh, that's the end. Very difficult to measure. Yeah, I had a I had a mentor of mine tell me that a complaining customer is the type of customer that you want. They are telling you exactly what you need to do to keep them. The easiest right. thing, yeah, like you said, the easiest thing for a customer to do is to switch providers and never say anything. Yep. Yeah. And and they do often. So, well, uh, so one of the things we kind of started at the top and we made a big circle. Justin, and we were talking about our programs, but I'd like to get your perspective on um, kind of comparing and contrasting between OM and EM, operations management, engineering management, and Lean and, and, and Lean Six Sigma, uh, and kind of the differences, the things that are the same, or the things that you see, or how do they apply to be done effectively in each of those? Yeah, sure. So. Uh, full disclosure, I'm not an engineer, but my brother is, and um, and I uh, my PhD is is in operations management from a business school, not from an engineering school. Um, but we we talk about these sometimes, and you know, on the OM side, I'd say the three pillars that we are focused on is um, improving processes, reducing variation, and increasing customer satisfaction. Operations, we're not necessarily as on the engineering management side, we're not necessarily in a design field where we are taking those customer, what, what, what's the customer satisfaction? Customer satisfaction comes from meeting customer requirements. So on in the EM side, going out and finding what are those customer requirements and coming back and designing and developing our product to meet those and ensure that it does that every time without variation um, is probably one of the bigger differences uh, that I see between the discussions with my brother and I, um, who's a who's an engineer, um, as opposed to once it's already done, and you know, and we're getting feedback from the customer in OM. How can we now come back and improve upon it as opposed to on the engineering side where we're designing, designing and building to meet customer expectations? And how do we, it, it sort of tackles it a little bit more. I see the engineering side um, kind of as the, uh, the offense um, and then OM coming in afterwards as uh, once the product or service is in operation and once it's designed and coming in as the defense to shore things up. Yeah, and and you see these things where it's hard to figure out where who does it belong to. Sometimes, uh, you know, I think and I probably uh, uh, demonstrate how or, or my level or lower level of sophistication and intelligence. But the Steve Martin did this movie, The Jerk, and he made this millions off of this glasses. If you remember, that had a bridge that you could grab, right, grab and, uh, but. He ended up going bankrupt because afterwards people were having eye problems, causing them to go cross-eyed and some other things. But the point is, was that an EM issue or an OM issue? So no OM looked or did, you know, and so uh, that's the kind of things when you look at a product and you're like, was it designed? Do we not ot and it like we should? Did our processes and ot and &E not work? Or was it a, a, a manufacturing issue we got to the end or even following up in OM to, get what our customers wanted. So it's tough to figure out where they, they cross, especially in smaller companies. Um, yeah. And it sounds like those glasses work the way they were supposed to, but the, the, or they were designed to, to look exactly that way. They just, the, the customer expectation was that they were not going to be blurry and, and what would right. I cause other problems, man, cause other problems. Yeah. yeah. So of it, course I'll, I'll blame it on the engineering side. Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of a, uh, kind of a, the, the way that goes is OM blames EM and vice versa. Right, but right. working together makes a makes a big difference. Obviously, places that do it effectively. 
Well, Justin, if there was so the 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 final question I'd have for you. So, uh, is there anything that you know we didn't talk about today? Do you think is important to understand if somebody is you know thinking about either you know beefing up their program or starting a program or trying to figure out if you know how to use Lean Six Sigma and if it's right for them? Anything that we didn't talk about today that you think you know would be effective tools for somebody sure. to use to start that journey? Yeah. So as I mentioned, you know, and you can just open up the paper today and go into the Wall Street Journal and you see that lean is the word for the year. Um, and there are many ways to accomplish that. Um, and I think that if somebody is in charge of an organization and they're a decision maker and they have a goal of achieving operational excellence that these topics such as improving customer satisfaction reducing waste improving quality um, enhancing the customer experience all of these things are applicable to most businesses most and not just private companies but most organizations um, the 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 big thing besides cost, though, to focus on is the last one I mentioned, the customer experience. And I have worked on Six Sigma projects in a variety of industries, but one that um, I particularly like is in healthcare, and the customer has changed to patient. And if you look at an uh, organization that is seeking operational excellence, we know that most medical care in the United States, and I, I may be totally wrong, but if I go in into, and I feel like I have a fever and I go into a doctor, most places are going to be able to tell that I have a fever, okay? Um, most places are going to prescribe me the same medicine. What gives my organization the competitive advantage to use these tools like Lean and Quality and Six Sigma um, is the experience, the customer experience and the way that they feel after they have left. Why is Amazon so successful? I can get product, I can go to walmart.com and buy the same products. I can buy my, my razors from there. But I also know that if I make a little bit of a larger purchase, it is very simple to return. And I don't even have to, the, the, the experience of uh, coming back as I walk out the door, and then what do I need to do when I, from the service side? So we think source, make, deliver, return. Oftentimes companies think that the competitive advantage would be on the delivery side, but it's actually on the return side where that customer comes back to you for service later. It could be a warranty department, service department at a car dealership. It could be the return and exchange uh, set up at Target. It could be anything that's giving me that last taste in my mouth of doing business with you that's positive. Um, because most things in today's day and age, products that we get on a day-to-day -day basis are commodities that we can get anywhere. And so you're not gonna really achieve the days of achieving competitive advantage based on just having a low cost, um, low cost food product is not necessarily, um, you know, the way to go. But if I have, uh, if I provide an experience and I have, people who are leaving that are happy, regardless of what the outcome was, even if it was something they didn't like, that it was a positive outcome that way, um, then we can compete and probably do pretty well. So I would look at this stuff as tying into operational excellence and using that to gain a competitive advantage on its own, not just cost, quality, and delivery, but on its own, looking at the experience of customers. Yeah, that what a great point because there's a whole new supply chain area developing in reverse logistics having to do with how you deal with uh, retail and and what a great advantage it is that Walmart has because they have you know you order it from Walmart.com but you you know you have a Walmart within five miles of you you can go and return it as opposed to going to UPS store or whatever else and so they've they've used that uh, pretty effectively. Yeah, and, I also saw. Uh, go ahead. I saw where Walmart is testing out an employee delivery program where employees who want to make um, some extra
cash are able to, um, they, they, the, the store looks at their route home on their way home and on their way to work and says, well, you're passing these three delivery spots. Why don't you, since you're going, why don't you just uh, make those deliveries for us? And that's interesting too. It's going to be an interesting way to see how that develops. Well, it, and, uh, you know, my background in uh, aviation, one of the things too, that that customer experienced the, that's so important with what you just said was how, what it does to branding, you know, and I remember taking the graduate course in the aviation economics and uh, you know, the first thing I remember the professor telling me, this has been a long time ago, but uh, he said, you know, in uh, aviation, when you make money, you make a little bit of money. When you lose money, you lose a lot. And uh, what really was driven home by um, this kind of penny wise, pound foolish uh, on purchasing scheduling software that Southwest, mm -hmm. did, by some mm -hmm. estimates, may cost them a billion dollars by the time that it's done. Um, but but somebody thought, hey, we can we can wait on the scheduling software and and uh, thought they were saving, you know, thirty or forty billion dollars on an update and end up costing herself a billion. So I think you hit the, hit the uh, nail on the head with how that all comes together and how important it is. So, well, Justin, thank you very much for uh, giving us your perspective. It's certainly useful with uh, your background and the number of things that you've done. And uh, I, I, I hope is useful to uh, our listeners about how they can start that journey to see what Lean Six Sigma can do for them. and and. Uh, I think your perspective gives them kind of this broad understanding of everything from leading change to project management, to highly compliant programs, you know, the kind of things that they have to do. So thank you again very much for uh, sharing your perspective today. Yeah, you're welcome. And thank you for having me. I hope uh, it provides a lot of value for folks. Thanks again. I enjoyed it. Thank you. Karin, uh, I'll turn it uh, back to you. And uh, thank you again, Justin. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Rich. That was fun. Well, that concludes today's episode. Thank you, Rich and Justin, for that insightful discussion on Lean Six Sigma in operations and engineering management. We would like to thank all of our listeners. And before you go, if you enjoyed today's conversation, would you mind leaving us a review on whatever podcast platform you're listening on? Our goal is education and helping people improve their professional skills and knowledge to advance in their careers. And positive reviews help others learn about our programs. Thanks, and we'll catch you on the next episode.